So on behalf of the Centre for Rural, Regional Law and Justice at Deakin University and Reconciliation Victoria, I welcome you to our forum today. My name is Maureen O'Keefe and I'm the Learning and Development Coordinator with the Centre and I'll be your facilitator today. First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands that we are meeting on today, and there are many. In Geelong and Ballarat, the Wathaurong people, in Bendigo, Jarra country, the traditional land of the people of the Jar Jar language, in Bairnsdale and Morwell, the Gunai Kurnai people, in Horsham, Wachabalak, Jadwa, Jawadali, Wigaya and Yapagalp people, in Shepparton, Yorta Yorta, in Swan Hill, Lachi Lachi, Tati Tati, Wamba Wamba, Parappa Barappa and Wadi Wadi peoples, and in Warrnambool and Portland, the Gunditj Mara people, and here in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri and Boorang of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Let us begin our discussion for today. Our constitution was written more than a century ago. By then, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples had lived in this land for more than 60,000 years, keeping alive the world's oldest continuous cultures. But Australia's founding document did not recognise the first chapter of our national history. Well, that may soon change. There is multi-party support for constitutional reform, which will, for the first time, provide recognition for Australia's first peoples. The movement for change is growing. Within the next 18 months, voters will be asked by a referendum to support or reject change. So what is proposed and how will that inform your voting? Today we'll be hearing from three speakers who will present on different aspects of the topic of re constitutional recognition. They will each present for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll be going to take uh, questions and comments. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Emily Chevelle. A project facilitated with Reconciliation Victoria, Emily works to raise awareness about the changes proposed for constitutional reform by the expert panel to recognise Australia's first people, as well as all Australians against racial discrimination across Victoria. All the way from uh, Boston, we have Dylan Leno, a researcher on constitutional reform. Dylan has been researching constitutional reform concerning Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people since 2010. This has been under a research project with Professor Megan Davis at the University of New South Wales Indigenous Law Centre, as well as part of a PhD at Melbourne Law School's Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. Long title there, Dylan. He has taught at University of Western Sydney, University of New South Wales and the University of Melbourne and is currently based in Boston. Welcome, Dylan. And finally, Greg Kennedy, State Coordinator for the Kuru Youth Council. Greg is a tatty tatty man whose role at the council is to represent the voice of young Koorees in Victoria State Government. Uh, Greg was the recipient of the 2011 Ricky Marks Young Aboriginal Achiever Award and is currently completing an undergraduate business degree at RMIT. Can I ask you to welcome all our speakers, please? Thank you very much. So we'll hand over to Emily now with uh, the microphone for our first presentation. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I would also like to begin by acknowledging, sorry, <coughs> uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands uh, where those who are video conferencing in today from across the state and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity to engage and raise awareness on a statewide level on this issue. Uh, I would like to thank the Centre for Rural Regional Law and Justice at Deakin University for making this possible and thank you to Maureen as well. Um, today I'm here to talk about the expert panel's proposal for constitutional recognition of Australia's first peoples. Our constitution was written more than a century ago um, and by then, as Maureen said, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have lived on this land for more than 60,000 years. The oldest continuing culture in the world and Australia's founding legal document does not recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their ongoing connection to land and country. Not only do we not acknowledge the first Australians, but we have no treaties or agreement making processes, unlike other former British colonies, and we are yet to protect our citizens from racial discrimination. Today we are in a position to change some of these factors and hopefully use 
this historic, these historic changes were the stepping stone to achieving justice and reconciliation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. There is multi-partisan support for constitutional reform, which will for the first time provide recognition for, Abri for Australia's First Peoples. Within the next two to three years, we'll be asked as a nation to cast a vote, a vote which will fundamentally change this nation's history and right the wrongs of the past. It will right the silences of our history. Since its inception, the Constitution has only been changed eight times out of 44 attempts. So the challenge that we have ahead of us as a nation is enormous. My role as part of Reconciliation Victoria is to raise awareness about constitutional recognition so people can make an informed decision because without the majority of the people from the majority of the states, what's called a double majority, voting yes, when we do go to a referendum, we will fail. The repercussions of a nation choosing not to recognise Australia's First Peoples and continuing to have provisions to make legislations based on race will challenge this nation's identity. On May 27, 1967, Australians voted overwhelmingly to change the Australian Constitution, provisions which, which prevented the federal government from making laws for Aboriginal people and excluded them from being counted in the census were removed from the Constitution. The yes vote of 90.77% 90 remains a record in the history of Australian referendums. After 1967, there was no mention of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our Constitution. It went from negating Aboriginal participation to making them as a people invisible in the founding legal document. Constitutional recognition uh, is not new. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous peoples have been campaigning and advocating for constitutional recognition for decades. Whether it's been in the same form that the expert panel's recommendations have proposed or within different uh, campaigns for recognition and acknowledgement uh, through the Carla Bart petitions, which we celebrated the 50th anniversary, or the Freedom Rides in 1965, 1966 with Vincent McGarry's walk-off, uh, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, um, this, the, count, the recommendations from the Council of Aboriginal Reconciliation, the Mabo decision, uh, I could go on. We are a country that is uh, rich in history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander champions advocating for change and we have a political opportunity to take this point and move forward as a country. Uh, the last three Prime Ministers have shown support for the expert panel's recommendations. There are two significant sections of the recommendations. One is to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the other is to remove sections which have provisions to legislate on the, race, on the basis of race as well as to include a protection against racial discrimination. These are important changes. Uh, it's not the end, though. There are, this is one step, as, and it's uh, an important step. It's something that, uh, you know, you could say is the right thing to do as a nation. Uh, it's about encouraging people to think about who we want to be, um, what it would mean, as I said earlier, to uh, have a have this referendum go ahead and for the result to be no would, uh, it terrifies me to be honest. Um, I just think it, it would fundamentally challenge uh, who we want to be and who we see ourselves if we get to a stage where we get to um, what I see as the don't know, won't know, um, which we've seen over many, many times through referendums held in this country. So. Uh, the main issue that we need to do is to raise people's awareness about why this is important so people can make an informed decision. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today. I'll now hand over to Dylan Lyon in Boston. Thank, thanks so much to the Centre for Rural, Regional Law and Justice and Reconciliation Victoria for having me um, and for everyone who's taken the time to, to tune in. It's a really great privilege to be able to speak today. Let me, let me start by acknowledging that I'm now living on the traditional lands of the Wampanoag people. So I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to them. And let me also acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Victoria and Australia 
whose voices in this debate uh, about constitutional recognition are so important. I'll be speaking for about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, um, and my job's to talk about the legal aspects of this issue. Hopefully my remarks aren't too technical uh, and legal um, or too basic. Um, and, and I'm very happy to take questions both on things I cover and things I don't. Just in terms of the structure of what I'm going to say, I'll start by um, just outlining in, in a very general sense what the Constitution is and does. Um, I'll then talk about how the Constitution impacts on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And then finally, I'll talk about what the expert panel proposed. And um, before I go on, I just want to say that I've had to set up in the living room of my new apartment. Um, and so there may be some noise from neighbours uh, or from my housemates coming in. So um, I apologise for that in advance. All right, so the Constitution um, is a, a legal document written in the 1890s uh, by old middle-class white men. Um, and it came into effect in 1901. It brought the different Australian colonies, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and so on, into one nation, a federation, and set up the federal government, um, sort of overarching the, the state governments. Um, it all allocates political and legal power among different parts of government in, in two different ways. So one is between the states and Commonwealth governments. Um, it divvies up responsibility between them. And the other way is that it allocates power between the different branches of the Commonwealth government. So the National Parliament, the courts, and the executive um, each have different functions and powers allocated to them under the Constitution. The Constitution also has two distinct legal features um, that I wanted to draw attention to, and they're, they're related to one another. Um, the first is that it's entrenched, and what that means is that it can't be amended simply through Parliament um, like regular legislation can. Constitutional amendments, as um, we, we heard Emily say, need to be approved by a national referendum of Australian voters. And so the Constitution's very hard to change. The other distinct legal feature is that the Constitution is um, Australia's highest law in legal terms. So what that means is that if a constitutional provision conflicts with a regular law that's been passed by Parliament, that regular law would be rendered invalid. We say it's unconstitutional. So in practice, the courts decide whether or not a regular law conflicts with the Constitution and um, is therefore invalid as a consequence. So these two distinctive features, um, the Constitution's entrenchment and its status as the highest law, uh, I think that they're some of the attractions of um, the Constitution for proponents of constitutional recognition. They mean that constitutional protections cannot be easily taken away on a whim by governments um, and can give some sort of stability and consistency to the relationships between Indigenous peoples and uh, Australian governments. All right, so that's the Constitution in general. I'll, I'll just talk a bit about what is in the Constitution now um, that, that particularly impacts on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, so we heard um, Emily mention the fact that the Constitution currently doesn't refer to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples at all. And that's been the case since the 1967 referendum, which removed two provisions which have expressly excluded Indigenous peoples from 
particular constitutional provisions. Um, so one provision um, that has a particular um, salience for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is what's known as the race power, um, section 5126. And it's a power of the Commonwealth Parliament to make special laws about particular racial groups. Um, and since 1967, that's included Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And I think the race power has been a bit of a mixed bag. So on the one hand, I think there's been the generally good effect that it has enabled the Commonwealth Parliament to pass laws protecting special Indigenous rights. So under the race power, the Commonwealth has enacted um, laws on native title, cultural heritage, uh, Indigenous corporations, councils, associations, the ATSIC legislation, which is, has been repealed. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, absolutely a conversation to be had about the, the adequacy of a lot of those laws, but I think the fact that they can be made um, and, you know, improved and so on um, is, is something that, that has probably generally been a good thing. But there are problems as well with the race power as it stands. So though it can be used for Indigenous people's benefit, it can probably also be used to pass laws that discriminate against Indigenous peoples. And I say probably because the High Court hasn't um, conclusively determined that, but, but a lot of the comments that it's made about the race power make it look like it can be used to, to discriminate. So that's one problem. Another problem is that the passing or repealing of laws under the race power can be done without any involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whatsoever. It's, it's sort of a, at the, the discretion of the Commonwealth Parliament. And the third problem is that it relies on the outdated concept of race rather than, say, uh, indigeneity as the basis for the making of these, these special laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So that's, that's the race power and that's probably the, the main provision that has um, the significance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Uh, there are a couple of others. One is Section 25 um, and this is another provision that's based on the concept of race. It explicitly concedes that state parliaments might disqualify groups of people from voting based on their race. And um, as I'm sure many people know, this has a, a particular um, relevance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who historically have been excluded from, from voting at the state and commonwealth levels. Another provision is section 122, also known as the Territories Power. And this gives the Commonwealth Parliament power to make virtually any law it wants in the Australian Territories, including obviously the Northern Territory. And it was this power, section 122, not the race power, uh, that formed the basis of the Northern Territory intervention laws uh, and the Stronger Futures legislation passed by the Commonwealth Parliament um, amongst um, other, other laws as well. Alright, so that's, that's the Constitution as it stands today um, and as it impacts in particular on uh, Indigenous peoples. So let me turn now lastly to what the expert panel recommended. Um, it operated throughout 2011 and conducted quite extensive national consultations, um, reporting back at the beginning of 2012. And it adopted four principles to determine its proposals. Um, each proposal had to be first, legally sound. Second, contribute to a more unified and reconciled nation. Third, be of benefit to and accord with the wishes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And fourth, be capable of drawing overwhelming support from the general public so that it could be supported at a referendum. And I think 
in those last two principles, you can see the expert panel trying to balance the demands of two different constituencies. So on the one hand, there's a need for support from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. What's the point in, in making proposals that Indigenous peoples reject? Um, on the other hand, if you want to amend the constitution successfully, you need to get overwhelming support from the non-Indigenous voting public. What's the point in, in making proposals that cannot possibly succeed at a referendum? So these demands can pull in different directions and they point to a need for compromise um, from, from both sides, I think. And so the challenge is to find some common ground amongst Indigenous and non-Indigenous constituents. Um, and I think we see in, in the expert panel's proposals that an attempt um, to do that. And I guess whether, whether that, that's successful is, is um, something we, we, we might want to discuss. Um, so in terms of the proposals the expert panel uh, made for constitutional amendment. I'll discuss them according to the four general goals that I, I see as underlying them. So the first goal was to remove existing provisions based on race. And these, as I said earlier, are section 25, which contemplates racially discriminatory state voting laws, and the race power. And so the expert panel wanted both of these repealed. It viewed the concept of race as an outdated one based on unscientific ideas that a person's ethnic identity is determined by how much blood of the particular ethnicity they have. And I'm sure people are aware that in the past, um, this way of thinking about um, identity has been used uh, to the detriment of Indigenous peoples, where their, their identity was sort of based on whether or not they were you know, full blood or, or half caste and so on. Um, and so the expert panel rejected race because it was grounded in these, these false um, biological ideas of, of Indigenous identity. The second goal uh, was to prohibit racial discrimination by Australian governments. Um, and so the expert panel proposed a new provision, section 116A, um, which would be inserted that would prohibit laws being passed or government decisions being made that discriminate against anyone on racial grounds. And um, you recall that one of the problems with race power and other provisions like the territory's power is that they can be used to make laws that discriminate against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So this new prohibition on racial discrimination would seek to correct that problem. And it doesn't just apply to the Commonwealth, it also applies to the states and territories. The third goal uh, was to allow the Commonwealth Parliament to continue making special laws about Indigenous peoples, as it has under the race power, um, but only for their benefit. So the expert panel proposed a new section, section 51A, which would be a Commonwealth power to make laws not on the basis of race, um, but explicitly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And in a, in a sort of a preambular statement, um, this power is said to be directed towards the advancement, um, to use the expert panel's word, um, of Indigenous peoples. Now, the prohibition on racial discrimination in section 116A that I mentioned earlier um, makes clear explicitly that it wouldn't preclude the passing of laws for the overcoming of disadvantage and past discrimination or for protecting Indigenous cultures, languages and heritage. So that kind of avoids any potential conflict with the, um, the prohibition on racial discrimination. Um, and the new power would likely support existing Commonwealth laws passed under the race power uh, that protect Indigenous rights, like legislation on native title and so on. Okay, and, and the, the fourth and, and final uh, goal 
was that the, the Constitution as a, a kind of national symbol should explicitly acknowledge distinct aspects of Indigenous identity. And in this vein, the expert panel recommended including several preambular statements in the new Section 51A power that I just discussed. So these statements would acknowledge the original occupation of Australia by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the relationship of Indigenous peoples to their lands and waters, and continuing Indigenous cultures, languages and heritage. The expert panel also proposed inserting a new symbolic provision, section 127A, recognising that English is Australia's national language, but that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages are Australia's original languages. And so, in these ways, the expert panel sought to have a, a distinct Indigenous identity acknowledged in the national symbol uh, that is the Constitution. All right, so I think I'll finish speaking there, um, and maybe we can talk a bit more about the legal aspects um, in questions. But that's great. We'll come, certainly come back with questions as we go through. Now let's hear a view from Greg Kennedy, the State Coordinator of the Koori Youth Council. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, so my name's Greg Kennedy. I'm a tatty man, and my people come from... People come from um, the Murray River in, around the Robin Vale area, which is in northwest Victoria, and down to the Murray region up to Barron. It's my, um, my grandmother's country. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about, I guess, the perspectives of Aboriginal people on constitutional reform, and hopefully trying to represent what's being said out in the community um, to what's, um, what's been proposed. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today. And, the land of the people in the other um, sites and pay respect to elders past and present. Now, I should say up front that I'm not an expert on constitutional reform or constitutional law. I guess I'm a, a young Aboriginal person who, um, who supports meaningful constitutional reform that reflects what I think is a, um, the values and the attitudes of the, the modern society. Um, as for the, the recognised campaign, there's been a lot of support by Aboriginal people and Indigenous leaders, people like uh, Noel Pearson, Pat Dodson, Lowell Show, Donoghue, um, Archie Rose, and Goods. Um, so some quite profile people within our community and, um, and politicians as well, so Kevin Rudd, Tony Abbott, um, Bill Shorten, Barnum Joyce, uh, I think reflects a bipartisan um, commitment to um, constitutional reform. And there's a lot of support from just ordinary people in the community, people, Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people, people I get to speak to every day about this. To most people that I speak to, um, this just makes sense. It makes sense to exclude clauses that make it possible for states to ban people from voting based on race and for governments to enact legislation that is fundamentally racist. It makes sense to acknowledge us as Aboriginal people um, yeah. as the first inhabitants of the land and acknowledge the very special place we have in this country's history. And on the flip side of that, it's plain wrong and unjust to, to carry on with a constitution that carries these race powers and blatantly lies about capturing the history of this country. Many people I speak to are, are plain horrified and surprised when to hear that this is still the case. I think it's a very natural reaction. This is a view that's shared by a lot of people. With all this support, I guess it'd be remiss of me not to um, mention those views that are, are, are a little bit different to those that we have um, from our community. And there are some valid concerns, I think. There's a view that this is um, simply a symbolic gesture the meaning constitution doesn't actually give Aboriginal people what we, what we really want, which is sovereignty, land rights, treaty, self-determination, etc. And let's face it, on its own, it doesn't do that. The constitutional reform doesn't preclude someone's right to seek out sovereignty, land rights, self-determination. And, um, and Dylan would know a lot more than me about this, but um, um, it does go beyond the symbolism and uh, there can 
is very practical applications to the implications of this. There's a fear that there'll only be an amendment to the um, well, an introduction of a preamble where the recognition of our people and the removal of racial clauses won't happen. This is a real possibility, I think, and then if it eventuates, frankly, it'll be a waste of time, a meaningless exercise. Speaking of that school of thought, you know, I was talking to my dad the other day, who's, um, who's pretty heavily involved in native title up in, in my home town, in the area of the Tanitana people. And um, he's it, a sort of an old school sort of fellow of um, 49 and 60. I was talking to him about um, what it would mean for him someone who was born before the referendum in 67 and he's, um, he very quickly reminded me every time we speak about it that he was born he says to me i was an animal before 1967 you know, i wasn't counted um it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything to me really um i can't see where it will go from here whilst i disagree with him to an extent i had a, a bit of a think about what our older people live through um, they fought for decades and decades for sovereignty and land rights. They witnessed um, Aboriginal affairs in this country swing like a pendulum. They had buried family members along the way who never saw the reference to seven or the apology um, and who won't see um, a yes vote on this. And haven't been let down time and time again. I, as a young Aboriginal person, can't comprehend what. Um, this in the same way that I guess there are other people who therefore I'm less burdened to an extent by this and by that challenging past. And I'm able to see things through a different perspective. But I see a very bright future and I see this as being uh, a start of something really special. I see it as something that needs to happen. We have something that will have very practical benefits for us as Aboriginal people beyond the obvious and little symbolic gesture. Well, there is a, a cynicism in me that believes that this may be some sort of compromise. Um, I do believe this is something that, at the very, very least, needs to happen for the healing of this country. It should be done because it's the right thing. So, although it may not be the giant leap that people like my dad and, and some of the older people might have wanted, um, certainly a very, very important step. Look, at this stage, everything's pretty much up for grabs. Um, the, the expert panel proposed that everything be put as a single question, so that it was, a, it was an all or nothing package, basically. Um, you, you wouldn't be voting on, you know, one question for the removal of Section 25, another question for the removal of the race power. You would be voting yes or no to the, to the whole package. They, they saw it as, as, as important to be dealing with all of these things at the same time. Um, but the, the former um, federal government didn't respond um, to the expert panel's report. Um, I think it was, it was a bit um, cautious, sort of waiting to see what the, the then opposition would, would actually um, be willing to accept, and so it didn't want to sort of put out a, a firm position. Um, so it, it didn't sort of say, say how, how, how it was going to go about doing um, the, any particular referendum proposal, and we don't know what the current government is, is going to, to propose now either, and, and what kind of form that would take. Um, I mean, they may be guided by the expert panel, but they're certainly not bound by, by what it recommended. So historically, is it easier to pass <laughs> everything rather than, you know, a selection, given that how hard it is for constitutional change to take place at all? Um, you know, what do you anticipate would be the, the most likely formula, I guess, for success in the Constitution? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on the history of, of referendums in Australia, but, um, I, I mean, I think 
on the one hand, one, one question would in some ways simplify things um, and mean you, 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 you know, wouldn't get a kind of a, a halfway result. Um, you, you sort of get everything or nothing. Um, my understanding is that in the past, when multiple questions have been put, sometimes people's negative response to one question seems to have had an impact on their response to another question, which might otherwise have gotten more support. Um, but then I think there have also been other cases where voters have been quite discerning and have approved one particular question but rejected another one. So I, I don't think, I, I don't know that there are any hard and fast kind of rules about how you go about succeeding. I think, um, I mean, I think the best strategy would be to, to really try and succeed with all of, all of the proposals, however they're put forward. Um, we have a question from uh, Sylvia in Warrnambool. Uh, considering the purpose of the Constitution is to outline federal lawmaking power, would it be preferable to have a statutory bill of rights than change a constitution? One, ad one advantage of, of a statutory bill of rights or other statutory protection uh, is that it can be done relatively easily. Um, it only has to get through the federal parliament. Um, and if you were looking at you know, particular provisions that uh, protect specific indigenous rights in a, in a Bill of Rights, then the, the Commonwealth Parliament has the power to do that under the race power. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 it could, you know, we could potentially, tomorrow, we could, the, the Parliament could, could pass a statutory Bill of Rights, though I, I don't think it's going to. Um, the, the advantage of the Constitution, while it's, it's, it's difficult to amend, is that once you amend it, then it's difficult to, to amend again. So you've, you've got your, your protections in there, um, entrenched in there for good, and they can actually trump other laws that are inconsistent with them. Whereas a statutory Bill of Rights, um, they, that can't actually trump other Commonwealth laws. If there's an inconsistency between the, the Bill of Rights and a later um, Commonwealth law, then the later law will, will prevail over, over the Bill of Rights. And um, so it's a kind of, it's a, it's a weaker form of protection. Um, Australia, Australia's constitution doesn't have many rights in it at the moment. It doesn't have a, a Bill of Rights. Um, but, you know, lots of other countries do. So it is, it is certainly, you know, um, I, I think it's, it fits within Australia's uh, constitutional system to, to have um, constitutional protections of, of Indigenous rights. Um, even though we haven't really seen those to date, I think the Australian system could cope well with that. Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a really excellent question. And, um, you know, the example of the Northern Territory intervention is, is one example that we can give where the government justified its action on the basis that it was for the benefit of Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. But, you know, I think the history of Australian government's dealings with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, replete with examples of, of a similar thing, the, the protection era, um, the assimilation eras. Um, you know, this this is where the you know the government purported to be acting in, in the best interest of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, without necessarily taking their views into account. So, um, if we're talking about uh, a constitutional well, okay, first of all, under the, the, the current race power, it's for the parliament to decide what kind of laws it makes about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples 
whether they be for their benefit or, or whether they be consistent with um, the wishes of Indigenous peoples or whether they be detrimental to, the, to them and be against their wishes. So there's no constraint under the current constitutional um, arrangements. The expert panel's proposal is to insert a new power to make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, generally, so that doesn't seem to have a constraint there. But there is a particular um, statement in the, the kind of the preambular um, provisions to that, that power, which, which says that um, sort of recognising the need to secure the advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and then it leads on and says, the parliament shall have power to make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So there's a question as to whether this imports a kind of uh, an, a notion of, of advancement, um, of the, that the laws would have to be advancing in some way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And, um, you know, a court looking at this may say, well, we, we will determine whether or not um, these laws are for the advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And um, I guess then you've got the problem of it's not, not the parliaments determining this, but it's the courts de determining this issue. And you know, maybe they're not going to be any better than, than parliaments have been um, in, in determining what constitutes Indigenous advancement. Um, so I guess I guess there is a problem that uh, the the proposals don't address um, or, or haven't been able to address um, in any kind of formal legal way, which is that um, that of trying to take into consideration seriously take into consideration um, the views of. Indigenous peoples themselves about the kinds of things um, that they want for for their own futures, um, and so you know governments may you know may consult um, and they may do so in good faith and they they may take on board what happens in those consultations, but but they may not as well, and um, so I think this is this is something that that the reforms that have been proposed don't quite get to and um, maybe it's something that, that needs to be addressed. Well, I, I think it's something that, that, that really does need to be addressed, um, but it's unlikely that it's going to be um, in this sort of this current circumstance. I think Emily's got a comment I'd like to hear about from Greg on this as well, but Emily, go ahead please. Just uh, quickly, um, with the section 116A that's been proposed to be inserted, which is the prohibition of racial discrimination, that would for the first time give the opportunity for legislations enacted against or that will affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples the opportunity to object or challenge those legislations. So although, so this will be um, the first time that you know if, if the NTR was. Uh, done in a few years or similar circumstances that there's the opportunity to challenge that on the basis of um, racial discrimination and, and then again there's a subsection that that has the uh, does not preclude uh, laws and measures being for overcoming disadvantage so it'll be again up to the courts um, as Dylan has said that uh, to determine whether or not it is racially discriminatory but it is an opportunity to challenge it which I think is, is a great benefit. It's always a challenge, isn't it, that um, when other people are deciding on behalf of what's best for other people, um, and we've seen plenty of history that that hasn't always worked out very well. Um, Greg, what, what is the general sense uh, from you know, your community, people you talk to, in terms of this um, benefit, who decides benefit? Sorry, some of the stuff that Alan was just saying is, I guess, not um, in the community or the public so much about, about the courts, um, but it is, I think it is dangerous to think that um, there is possibly um, scope, I guess, for, for um, laws to be made that, um, that 
can be left to interpretation of what's beneficial for Aboriginal people. So, um, yeah, um, it's, um, I think, exercise of caution. And we do have another question for Greg. Um, what's the most effective way to respond to Indigenous people who say that this uh, change will prevent action on sovereignty and treaty? Not easy one for me, Greg. Because there are some sectors of, of the Aboriginal community, as I understand it, who aren't supportive. You talked about some are, most are, but there are others that, that you know, don't really want constitutional recognition. It's a really good question. Um, I think, um, uh, unfortunately, in, I guess, in Aboriginal affairs in this country, Aboriginal people are expected to agree on a lot of things, on, on everything to make change. Um, it must be remembered that we are a diverse people. We, um, we, we come from the, the different lands. Um, we've grown up differently. Um, there's a difference with you know, some, some maybe the old school thinking between, um, as opposed to some of the younger people who are coming up. Um, I guess, I guess, um, Try not to push it too much, because <laughs> um, even me as, a, as an Aboriginal person trying to sort of um, push this, I guess, or, or trying to talk about some of my uncles and my elders and stuff about about this, um, people think what they think, and um, that must be respected as much as anything. So I, that kind of doesn't really answer your question, but I guess the, the meaning that is that we. We are different, we do have different points of view. I think most of the original people are for this, um, but it needs to be understood where some people might be coming from if they use a contradiction. I guess to respond to that, um, that question or statement as well is um, that it's not uh, discriminatory to recognise history and legacy, and that's part of the recognition that's been proposed, is that we are recognising that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have been on this land for 60,000 years, um, and that if we continue to have a constitution that seems to begin in 1901 or 1788, um, that, this, that this country is, is framed on lies, and I think it, it, it should be a benefit and it should be something that we take pride from, that we um, that we live on, on the lands of such great uh, cultural knowledge and history and strength and pride. Um, and I think that's something that if we learn to understand and begin to appreciate more, that, that's part of Australian history and we have opportunities to learn much more from and Torres Strait Islander peoples about um, you know, their ongoing connections to land and sea. So, I mean, we. We have heard those comments, but at the same time, I think once you have those com the conversation with people saying, what does it mean for you not to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? Why do you feel more comfortable with that rather than the opportunity to change? Um, and I think for young people, for people, uh, I've done a lot of talks with schools, this is something that excites them, that they get the opportunity to learn more about Australia and more uh, rather than uh, sort of the Australian history that begins um, you know, with our four founders coming on ships, that we appreciate that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders were here, they fought for this land, and it was not ceded. So I think it's, people are sometimes uncomfortable with change, but I think there are, there are real benefits from uh, taking ownership of our history. It's an uncomfortable history, but it's something that I think once we begin to understand and learn more from, that it's something we can also be incredibly proud of to, uh, to live on this land. Um, there are, and I think Greg's right in terms of um, showing respect for, for different views um, when it comes to treaty and sovereignty. Um, and also that the expert panel's recommendations do not negate further um, further opportunities for advocating for treaty or agreement making processes or it doesn't negate um, sovereignty. So they're two very separate issues in some ways but um, also that this opportunity um, brings into the consciousness of peoples what what we still need to do. This is not a fair complete, I guess it's, a, it's, it's another opportunity to, to make a statement of who we are as a nation and to take a step forward. So. Um, 
it's it, I think it's a it's a really positive opportunity to have ongoing discussions. Um, it's not the end; it's, it's simply a, a stepping stone of understanding ongoing needs for reconciliation and justice. And Greg, what do you think the significance will be, particularly for young people, people of your generation, to actually have this change take place? Will it make any difference in in the way that um, you, know, you think that you'll have esteem within the community? You know, what, what do you think difference it will really make to people? Oh, well, I think it will make an enormous difference. Um, you know, I think um, about, I guess, the legacy it will leave for my children one day, uh, and <laughs> for my children's children, you know, being recognised in our final, family document that we were here for such a long time before before settlement. Um, yeah, I guess, um, and going back to some of the points earlier about um, how this may elevate us above other groups, I think, I think it being factually based in terms of us being here for, for so much longer than before, um, before the Constitution was written. And I think that, if I'm not mistaken, the, um, the current Constitution enables um, legislation to us on, on, on any, um, race, any group of, um, of colour. So there's, there, there's implications for other groups as well um, that, um, that may not be um, white Australian, I guess. So it's, um, it's very much relevant for other groups as well as Aboriginal groups. Uh, but yeah, going back to the original question, I think it's, um, it's a it's about time this discussion's had. Um, I think um, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about Aboriginal people in the public mind, I guess, since the apology. Um, so I think it's a good time to get things going again, to have you know, everyday people start thinking about the history of this country and Aboriginal people. It is um, a sort of an unknown in some ways, but um, what we do know is that uh, recently uh, our Prime Minister Tony Abbott has uh, again stated his commitment to this, um, and the message from his government is that the model would be released um, by the end of next year, which is pretty much on, on time for his pre-election promise of within the first year of um, his term. Um, the Joint Select Committee, which was charged with sort of ongoing uh, discussions around constitutional recognition, hasn't been reformed um, within this government. Um, it's being done at the moment, so we don't know who's on that uh, committee as yet. Um, and they will again make recommendations to government about this process. Um, we are currently in a, what's called a sunset clause. So um, in February next year, they have to return to this issue and make another commitment to um, what's next, I guess. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the refer referendum has to be called then and there, but it is gonna, they will have to make a statement about uh, another time frame um, <coughs> to address this issue. Um, what is really positive is that um, the, the Joint Select Committee, uh, the previous Joint Select Committee reported back in September that um, the uh, recommendations for protection against racial discrimination were still seen as, as valid within these conversations. Um, and that came with uh, George Brandis, who will most likely be uh, on the new Joint Select Committee, um, being involved as well. And so he's probably one of the more conservative um, parliamentarians involved. So I think there is, um, there is a sense that, um, as far as we are aware, that the recommendations are being considered and, and seen as valuable. Um, the, so there is the journey to recognition, which is currently uh, going through WA and will uh, finish up in Perth on the 3rd of December, I believe, where they will also launch students for recognition. Um, if they'll then take a, a summer holiday. <laughs> um, uh, they didn't want to travel across Australia in the searing summer heat, so they'll begin again in sort of late February, early March, I believe and sort of head up towards Cape York, which is the next sort of big step. Um, so there is a recognised, uh, would like to see it happen uh, within this government term. There has been whispers that it might be in the first year of the second term. 
Um, but as I said, it is an unknown, so to speak, but we are still in negotiations, they are recognised as in negotiations with government about what would best work. They've done an enormous amount of polling um, and research into uh, sort of how to keep momentum and keep people involved and invest invested in this um, campaign uh, and obviously we'll need further resources. So their funding runs out, I think, in June next year. So they're obviously renegotiating that to, to ensure that this is given enough and adequate time and resources to be effective. I think 40%, the most recent polling was that 40% of the population um, support constitutional recognition. Um, and are aware of what, well, sorry, they're aware of that constitutional recognition is being discussed, um, and it was about 70% supported it, whether or not they'd heard of it or not. So there's still a long way to go. I mean, they, to get anywhere near 67, if, if that's what we want to see as sort of the, the line, um, we really need to build the support, the ground. Um, the grassroots campaign needs to be effective and clear, and that's, that's about finding space for people to feel involved and feel connected and feel like it's something that they can identify with. And that's partly what Recognise is doing. It's the role that Greg has at Kuru Youth Council, it's RecVic, it's all the different organisations that have said this is something that they support. Um, need to find ways to talk to their members, to talk to the public about why this is important because um, as we're probably all aware, when it comes to sort of Indigenous affairs, there seems to be a tick box approach. Oh, we've done that. Oh, we apologise. We've got native title. We've done this. We've done that. And part of this, um, part of what's important here is to raise into sort of people's consciousnesses that this is not it and this is not enough, but this is an ongoing commitment to ongoing reform. As a kind of a, a, a moral moral question, I I, I think um, you know it, it it's a bit strange for the the Australian common law to have to have given in effect what is what is a, a form of constitutional recognition I think outside of the document of the constitution, um, but effectively to to constitutionally recognise the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were here before British settlers arrived and that they had systems of law in place then and that they have rights that flow from that after the, after then. And so, uh, I, you know, I, yeah, I agree that I, it, it, it it's an odd situation to have that existing recognition sitting with um, a, a constitutional document that says nothing about that, let alone anything else about um, Indigenous peoples at all. So this is obviously not going to address that. That's going to continue to remain a bit of an anomaly? Uh, well, uh, I mean, it, the, the proposals of the expert panel do try and address that in, in, in different ways. So um, the constitution, if it were amended according to the proposals, would make reference to the fact that um, Indigenous peoples had occupied Australia prior to British settlement. It would make reference to um, the special relationships between uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their um, their traditional uh, lands and waters. Um, it would it would refer to um, distinct Indigenous cultures, languages, and heritage. So I think I think that is to some extent of a piece with with um, what was recognised in. The Marbo decision, although those 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 recognitions are um, at least it, it seems to me pointing more towards symbolic kinds of recognition rather than um, you know uh, pre explicit protection of, of say native title rights or something in the constitution. 
Um, but nonetheless, they are a, a kind of a step away from a, a terra nullius mentality, if you like, within the Constitution. First, I'd, I'd say go to the recognised website, have a look, um, join as a supporter, because it's, um, I think we really need as many as we can on board to support it. Um, I think this is going to be a real nation building exercise, I think, that we will really benefit um, this generation and future generations. So I, I'd say support it, um, get your head around it a little bit, make sure that. Um, some of the recommendations that we're putting forward are, are what's in um, the referendum, what we're voting on. Um, I think anything less than that won't be satisfactory for, for anyone and won't be beneficial for this country. Um, so, yeah, but uh, yes or, or else. <laughs> I think it's really exciting. I, um, I'm thrilled to be a part of something that, uh, you know, is our, this is this generation's opportunity to make a statement of, of who we are as a nation. Um, and I certainly don't think this is an end point, and I've said that um, multiple times today, but I do think it is a starting point, and um, it brings people into the conversation about um, where we are as a nation and where we've come from, and an opportunity to, um, to have a moment of truth-telling in this nation. I don't think it happens very often, and it gives an opportunity now to uh, to teach our children and our children's children um, that there is, you can reform from mistakes of the past. Um, and it, uh, I, I'm excited to see the model. I do hope that it, it sticks true to what the expert panelists proposed. They did an enormous amount of work and consultative work at that. Um, and that it may not be enough, but it, it's, it's it's really important that it's not watered down at the same time. Um, and with that, the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples partnered with the protection against racial discrimination and the removal of the race clauses is such a strong statement. Um, and I think it's something that we can bring people in to be proud of. Um, I think as much as there are concerns um, across whole different population groups and, and community groups, um, that, it, that once you start to have the conversations that some of those feelings and concerns are dispelled because um, it, it is what it is, that there's not much to be scared of here and I'm, you know, I'll, I'll obviously speak again when the model comes out if, if I'm uh, not, care, not uh, happy with it, but what the expert panel has proposed is, is fairly um, it, it does. It's not challenging. It won't. It won't change the world, but it, it will um, change hopefully how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and children grow up feeling um, that they are recognised in our national document. I, I, I can't speak of what it would feel like to be invisible in such a document, and I think that it's a real shame, a national shame. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be a part of a, a movement for change. And Dylan, to you, any final comments? Um, I think I think Emily <laughs> spoke really well just then. I I would just want to echo something uh, that, that Emily has said a few times. It's something that I um, I strongly believe that we really shouldn't be viewing this process important as it is, as, as an end point, as, as the kind of, as Tony Abbott has put it, the completion of the Constitution. I think um, we really should view it as part of a, a kind of a, an ongoing process. It's not about, you know, solving once and for all Australia's Aboriginal problem. Um, that, that sort of seems to hark back to earlier eras where various solutions to the Aboriginal problem um, were proposed. Um, it really, I think, needs to be thought of as, as part of an ongoing conversation and process, um, a sort of contestation and negotiation of uh, the Australian constitutional order uh, in the name of justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples.
Thanks very much, Dylan, particularly um, for making the time available. I know you've uh, done this all through your dinner. It must be about 8 o'clock now, I think, in Boston. Uh, so can you join me now in thanking all our speakers, Emily Chevelle, a project facilitator from Reconciliation Victoria, Dylan Lino, a researcher on constitutional reform, and Greg Kennedy, the state coordinator for the Koori Youth Council, for giving their time to us today.